it. Okay, you're gonna lay down right there? I don't know if anybody can see you down there. Maybe they can. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. You can ask questions down below this video and I pick from those each week. As you might expect here in early April, there's a lot of questions, so I'm definitely not getting to uh, all the questions. I'm trying to pick ones that um, are kind of relevant um, to what's going on uh, at this time of year, so um, keep that in mind. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of good questions. I think the first thing I should talk about uh, this week is cold uh, coming up. I think so. I think Tuesday night here. Uh, I think currently it's forecast 37, 38 here in my area in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. So I'm assuming not too far to the north. It's probably closer to freezing and 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 maybe to the south of me a little bit. You probably escape without any frost. It was 43 degrees predicted a few days ago and it keeps dropping each night. So I'm, I'm, I'm expecting there'll at least be some frost in some outlying areas. It's just too early um, to be putting in tomatoes and peppers and uh, all of those annual things until after that passes. And so I'm gonna wait um, probably through next weekend um, before I start planting. Keep in mind your, your frost date is your average last frost date. So mine's around the 15th. We've passed that. As I'm filming this, I'm, I'm on the other side of where my average last frost date is. But again, looking at the forecast, thinking we probably have some chance of a light frost uh, on Tuesday. Probably more likely in outlying areas than right here in the city where I'm at in Raleigh, but um, no point in risking it. I'm gonna keep all my annuals out of the ground until after that passes. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, they'll come in um, in all likelihood for the evening and just spend the evening in the kitchen. Uh, and then come back out the next day. And then I think we can start putting them in the ground. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked about um, dark foliage perennials. Um, and, you know, perennials can be shrubs or obviously perennials. So there's a loripetalum right there. Um, loripetalum, smoke bush, nine bark, um, you know, are some shrubs, barberries. You know, there are lots of shrubs that have that dark purple uh, coloration. And then of course, herbaceous perennial wise, you can have things like penstemon or ajuga uh, that have black or dark foliage, lots and lots. There's just, um, you know, tons and tons of things uh, that have that dark foliage. Be careful using dark foliage. I want you to pay attention to this, how dark that spot actually is, you know, um, you know, in my, in my landscape. So, you know, it needs to uh, think about where you're using dark foliage things. Um, sometimes at the garden center, you know, some of those dark things just, they really stand out in the container. They really stand out in the, in the garden center. But when you get them home and you plant them in the ground and you walk away a hundred feet and look back at them, you can't make out any detail in them whatsoever. So I tend to use less dark foliage things than other people do. I'm drawn to them, same as you guys. <laughs> Trust me, I, I, I like them just as much. But when I use dark foliage things, it tends to be things like, I mean, I have a few loripetalum, um, uh, but I, ten, I tend to use um, uh, like some, some dark foliage annuals, like I'll use a dark foliage coleus, but it'll go with yellow coleus and other flowering things that make it, make it in of itself pop uh, in the landscape against uh, lighter foliage things. So just, just throwing that out there. Um, Let's see, somebody asked about perennials that can be planted under their blueberries. So for me, my blueberries are along the driveway out there and I have bulbs under planting them. So my daffodils came up in the middle of the blueberries uh, and then the blueberries bloomed. And I have St. John's wort. There's a gold St. John's wort right there called Brigadoon. Um, looks great, would look great under the blueberries, but the one I have out there is just a green, a green version of this St. John's wort. So, Lots of things, anything that'll crawl on the ground um, underneath them will be fine. Keep in mind when you start competing, you know, sometimes it might require a little bit more water, um, but it certainly requires less mulch if you have ground covers around them. Okay, so Mike, a lot of questions about cutting thin plants. I'm probably answering 40 questions uh, that get answered every week. So that Laura Petalum has gone 12 feet tall on me back here um, and uh, needs to be cut. So after it finishes flowering, it's flowering up near the top, Right now, you can't, may not be able to see it in the frame. Um, as soon as it's done, I'll be pruning it. So you'll see, in the next three weeks, you guys are gonna see some, a couple, at least a couple pruning videos from me. I'll prune a couple things that have gotten a little leggy. Uh, I'll prune a couple things that are summer flowering that I haven't pruned yet. Um, I'll prune a, couple, a few things like azaleas that have finished flowering and they don't set their flower buds until next year. So you guys will see upcoming pruning videos. I tend to wait again until after frost on a lot of those things, except for the things that I pruned earlier. I, I had put up some pruning videos 
uh, weeks ago. Uh, some things that can be winter pruned, um, but uh, uh, but the early spring flowering things I'll prune right after they're finished, and you guys will see that in some videos. But yes, you're you know obviously if you have thinning down at the bottom of your leafy evergreen plants, you can cut the tops on them to get some light down into them and uh, get them to fill out more. Doesn't work with conifers as well. And I think I got a question like that coming up. Uh, somebody asked about, um, should they have cut their seed potatoes before they had eyes on them? You know, before they had actually had any growth on them because now they're rotting uh, in the bags. I, um, the only potatoes that I actually do cut, I do see the eyes coming on them first and then I cut them and I leave them just like this person did for usually a day uh, to dry out where the wounds are, where the cuts are, and then I plant them. Um, but my fingerling potatoes did not have any new growth on them yet, and I just put the whole potato in the bag rather than cutting them. So um, that could have been part of the problem or they've just been kept too wet, um, which is also an issue. Or the potatoes were maybe almost too far gone. I've bought seed potatoes before that were already on the verge of being a little bit too mushy. Um, so they had just, uh, they had been in the boxes too long or whatever they were stored in uh, when they were shipped. So it could have been bad potatoes, could have been cut too early, could be kept too wet in the bags. Um, some version of that. You can still got plenty of time to replant potatoes. So, you know, that, that's what I would do. Um, yeah, and then zone 6A, somebody's arborvitae is thin um, at the bottom. Wanted to know if there's much you can do about it. There's several things that will cause that thinning at the bottom of arborvita. One is deer. <laughs> a deer can definitely cause, cause thinning at the bottom of them uh, in a big way. Uh, they, they love to uh, limb them up for you. Uh, lift, their, lift the skirts on arborvita. It's kind of a deer, what deer do. Um, and then, of course, underwatering. You know, we tend to plant these arborvita in you know, four, five, six feet apart, and then they're rooting together, and then they're um, competing for water and nutrients and, and, and things. And so that thins the bottom of them. And then, of course, uh, uh, the fact that the plant just can't get light down to the bottom of itself. Once it reaches a certain height, you know, those conifers are angled back like this. You know, pruning should be done like this because it allows light to penetrate all the way down to the bottom of the plant. I see frequently people prune things straight up and down, or they prune things like this, it doesn't allow light to the bottom. So the conifers naturally grow where they can get that light down to the bottom, but then we plant them so close together that prevents that from happening. So um, you may be just not getting enough light down to the bottom of them. I would plan for anybody who's doing an arborvita hedge to eventually have to underplant them, that they're going to thin from something at some point. And so uh, leaving that in your mind, that at some point you probably need something that gets five, six, feet tall that's evergreen uh, to underplant in front of them. Um, and just plan for that uh, in the future. They, they might be able to be, I don't know how big they are, you might be able to shear them some and get them to fill out down at the base, but it would be such a slow process, I would probably think about underplanting them. Uh, let's see, uh, somebody wanna know what the best annuals are to plant around distillium. There's a distillium right there, and it's another one of these kind of dark it's dark green, bluish foliage, so it doesn't show up quite as well uh, in the landscape, but against this yellow, you know, it does look great. Um, so any, again, here's, some, here's an example of a yellow plant uh, next to a, um, a darker plant, you know, and, it, and then they do pop with one another. So if you've got, you know, any gold foliage thing you wanted to put with it, like um, lemon coral sedum or a coleus or something like that, yellow flowering thing, white flowering thing, something that's really super, super bright uh, in color, but stays, but stays smaller than the distillium you have. This one's a super dwarf. It only gets about a foot and a half tall. It'd be hard to find an annual that would stay lower than that other than a ground cover, you know? Um, so, uh, but if your distilliums get four or five feet tall, of course you have more options, but I would pick something that's brightly, has a bright flower on it to pop in front of that dark foliage. That would be my recommendation. Okay, um, somebody uh, cutting back, oh, this is another one of those cutting back questions. They've got a, a snowball viburnum, and they've got five or six branches that have gone up way higher than everything else. Want to know when, when, if they can prune them off? Yeah, absolutely. Should be blooming now, probably, but you can do it after they, uh, after they flower or now. Um, it does, doesn't really matter, but that would be one of the ones I would have on my pruning list if I needed to prune one um, in, in a couple weeks. Uh, somebody had some pi a pineapple lily bulb, and they were moving it, I guess, and cut off the tip of the bulb. Wanted to know if they had done any um, 
permanent damage to it. Um, it probably will offset, you know, it's in that asparagus family and, and most things other than that uh, agave that I planted, uh, this, that particular agave I planted this week. Um, um, offsetting just means another, you know, bulblet will form to the side of it um, and uh, allow for some new growth. Um, but a mature bulb will probably find a way uh, to put on some put on some new growth. Sometimes on something like that, if I damage something, you know, if I thought I damaged it, I might leave it out of the ground temporarily, uh, meaning I might put it in a container um, where it might have a, uh, a slightly better environment than throwing it back in the ground somewhere. Um, just throwing that out there. That if, I, if, that if I damaged something, if I thought I damaged something or I thought I had, you know, that it was in a bad, bad shape as I was pulling it out of the ground. I might container plant it, get it back into better shape, and then and then put it in the ground. So you might do that with that bulb. Um, yeah, I get constant questions about peonies, you know, not blooming in the first or second year, and that's very typical with peonies. Sometimes you can plant peony tubers, and the very first year they just rock it out of the ground. You get four or five blooms on them, and it's great, no problem. Sometimes it can take three years to get the first flower on a small tuber that you bought from Home Depot or Lowe's or a garden center or whatever. I've got a, a peony opening. Um, I, I see it, you guys will see it in my tour video. I actually already have a peony opening. Um, but all the ones I did in a peony dividing video, um, I guess that was two falls ago. Um, I had a few blooms last year and I have a, a lot more coming this year. Next year, they'll just be full on. So don't worry about that kind of thing. They're establishing themselves. The tubers are getting bigger. Um, eventually you'll have a big show. Uh, somebody have, um, uh, uh, hellebore aphids, which, um, what is that? Uh, uh Macrocyphum hellebori or whatever that is. I think that's the name of that Latin name of that, uh, hellebore aphid. I love insects that only do one thing. I think it's the coolest thing. Uh, I know people hate insects in general, but an insect that lives to do one thing, which is suck the juice out of one particular genus of plants, is just so wild to me. But there is a hellebore aphid. Wanted to know what to do about them. This is a good argument for making sure you're cutting back the foliage on your um, on your uh, um, hellebores in the winter time. I've got, I've got probably three videos over the years about um, um, cutting back and cleaning up your hellebores in the winter time. Giving those aphids, don't give those aphids a place to hide um, underneath them. Make sure you're pulling leaves back and stuff. And when you're new, um, you know, all that new growth is coming up out of the ground. It's clean and kind of open. Um, that's one thing. The other thing you can hose, you know, hose those aphids off as well. You know, blast them with the water hose, but make sure the area around them are clean. If they're too, if they've gotten too thick over time, cause you know, we all know that a lot of those hellebores will become kind of weedy uh, in the future. They do need to be thinned out occasionally. So thin them out if they're overgrown. Make sure you're cutting the foliage back in the late, in, during the winter so that the new, when the new growth comes up out of the ground, they're clean and open, open space around them. Predators can get to those aphids, that kind of thing. Um, but I do love an insect that, you know, literally only evolved to do one thing. Somebody asked the difference between Gerber and Shasta daisies. Gerbers tend to come in a lot of colors. You'll see them super colorful. Um, they tend to grow lower than Shasta daisies. Shasta daisies typically are white, but now there's lots of new yellows and creamy color ones. And um, Shastas tend to be, you know, blooming in the heat of the summer when the cone flowers and the black eyed Susans and those kinds of things are blooming. And they give you that big pop of white color uh, in the middle of it, or, or now, like I say, creamy whites and yellows and that kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, Gerbers tend to be, uh, can be fussy, <laughs> can be fussy, or you can put them in the ground and they just do great. There's some Gerbers blooming at the church around the corner already. Uh, it's April 11th or something. They got the Ger Gerbers bloomed until November and then they pop right back. They started blooming again uh, just, a, just a week or so ago. I tend to not uh, use Gerbers. Um, I sold lots of them when I had my garden center. They tend to be, like I said, they tend to be a slightly, slightly more fussy. And they're almost too perfect um, for me. And I'm a person who grows some dahlias and dahlias can be uh, overly perfect. I don't, I kind of like imperfect, imp a little bit of imperfection in the garden and Gerbers tend to be hard to, uh, uh, they don't fit that imperfection for me. You know, the wildness of the garden. Um, but uh, they're both, they're both, you know, gosh, they're, <laughs> lot, lot are sold of both of them. But anyway, Shastas get bigger. 
bright spot in a summer garden um, and, and tend to be slightly easier. Now somebody's gonna tell me, my Gerbers are the easiest thing. Okay, somebody asked me about, they can't find pine bark soil conditioner in California, wanted to know what to mix into their clay. I wish I'd have never really talked about pine bark soil conditioner very much because it's a very regional product to the Southeast because we have all the pine trees where you know the, a lot of the lumber for the U.S. is produced in you know, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, um, and paper products. Uh, from our pines, and we have all that pine bark uh, that we use to, you know, grow nursery plants in and mulch and, you know, all, all kinds of things, but it's not available necessarily to people around the country. So just use some compost um, and, or nothing. You know, nothing is the right answer, too. You can put plants, you know, in your clay soil with nothing, just mound them up some, and then put your compost and mulch on the top and let the earthworms and that kind of thing carry that stuff down into the uh, into the ground. I have improved this soil from the top down. You know, it hasn't been tilled other than a couple little spots that you guys have seen me till, like this little spot next to the turf, which I did, you know, uh, a week ago in a video, but it was only this much of this ground. Everything else has been improved from the top down. So, um, and the compost has just been mixed in as I went. I didn't use the pine bark soil conditioner here like I did at the old house on purpose because I just wanted to show folks that you don't, it's not a necessary thing and I wish I, it, for, for a channel that has people watching from all over the place, um, I wish I hadn't have mentioned a regional product in the first place. Uh, you're fine with compost. Um, if somebody has a clematis that uh, woke up inside and wanted to know if it's safe to move it outside, yeah, you pretty much have to move it outside, but you need to move plants that have really woken up a lot inside and put on a lot of growth. You definitely did not have enough light in them compared to the sunlight outside. So when you move them outside, move them a little bit at the time. So you move them, maybe put them out uh, after five o'clock in the evening, after four o'clock in the evening, one evening, let them get some sun as the sun's going down or in the morning as the sun's coming up. Do that for a couple days and then give them more and more sun. Over about four or five days, you can have them in the full sun, but they need to be you know, two hours the first day, four hours the second day, six hours, eight hours, that kind of thing. Um, we had to be really careful with that in the nursery business because I would receive plants that had been in a box you know, for four or five days. Could be a full sun plant. It was grown in the full sun in Florida. And then I got it in, um, you know, uh, uh, Garner, North Carolina, took it out of the box and it sunburned because it had been in a box for four days. So, you know, I have to put, take stuff out of a box that had been grown in the full sun four days ago um, and put it under a shade cloth um, for a couple days. Okay, got a dog barking back here behind me. We'll see how that goes. Somebody asked me about planting zinnia or sunflower seeds on top of their tulips. Absolutely. I would, I would definitely plant any uh, annual seeds that you want to right over top of your bulbs that have finished flowering or, or are flowering. It doesn't, doesn't really matter because um, by the time those things come up, uh, they'll be, uh, the bulbs will be done and it'll just be the foliage on the bulbs. So it'll help kind of blend away that as well. So yeah, go for that. Um, Cosmos is another one you could use. Uh, somebody asked about what um, vegetable seeds they could direct sow in zone five. I don't think this matters what zone, but the easiest ones to direct sow into your garden um, are all the uh, curcubits. Curcubits are gourds, and so um, that's going to be cucumber, squash, zucchini, gourds, um, if you wanted to grow gourds. Uh, any of those things are super easy from seed in the ground, um, and then any of your... Um, uh, pea family things, your Fabaceae things, which are beans, so any beans, so any kind of, any kind of pea that you're growing or, um, or, or bean uh, that you're growing uh, in your garden. Those are the easiest, easiest things. Of course, corn, if you were going to do corn, um, uh, probably the most expensive corn in the world if you did a row of corn at your house um, uh, compared to buying it. Uh, okra is another one uh, that can be done from seed easily and probably anything really. I mean, um, all of your, uh, um, we always did our collards and lettuces and things in the fall direct seeded when I was a kid. I do them inside now because I like some control over it, but um, um, of how they're lined up in the garden and everything. I don't know why I feel like I need this control, but I'm, almost everything can be direct seeded. Tomatoes, uh, peppers, um, potatoes, you know, tend to, tend to be a little bit, um, tend to be a little bit harder. And so potatoes from seed potatoes are easier and um tomatoes and peppers are easier done inside. So that, there you go. Um, but almost literally everything else. Okay. Um, I get a lot of questions, of course, about yellowing leaves, especially this time of year. So if you have, 
Oh, I don't know what's up with this dog. I've got several dogs that have decided to start talking to one another here. Um, so I get lots of questions about yellow leaves on plants uh, this time of year and almost any time of year. So just quickly going through this, if you have a lot of yellow growth on, or on your new growth on your plants, sometimes that's an indicator that they're over, uh, that they're over watered. Um, though they're being over loved to death in some way, because generally speaking, that's a nutrient deficiency of some kind. Um, so if you're seeing kind of vein, um, yellowish leaves with the bright veins on them on the new growth, that typically that's some sort of deficiency, like iron deficiency. Can't cure it with iron though. Something's wrong with the roots pulling the iron up. Um, so generally speaking, that's what that is. If you see yellowing on the interior of the plant, uh, typically that means they're they're dry and they're gonna put on new growth. They're gonna flower, azaleas will drop tons of leaves to flower. I mean, these azaleas, if they weren't watered, they drop every leaf on the plant in order to flower. Um, that's what they do. Um, so again, typically it's, it's a, typically a water um, related uh, issue. Uh, the plant's not happy in some way if it's got yellow on the new growth. Yellow on the old growth, like I say, usually generally just means it's it needed more water at the time that it needed more water. Doesn't mean it needs water today, but at the, that, that time that it was starting to set that new growth. A lot of people ask me questions about how their azaleas are thin or they don't bloom um, as heavy as mine. Keep in mind, these buds were set on these in the fall. I mean, if you didn't water them in September or, or August, that's when the stress on that plant would have caused the problems that you're seeing on your azaleas today. And um, and I think that's probably an important thing I should point out when I show azaleas is, you know, when I show um, something that's this full of flowers here, that was, that, that, was, that was done by that plant six months ago. It wasn't done in the last few weeks. Um, you know, everything had been set in motion. So make sure fall watering is important for early spring flowering plants. So, you know, it doesn't matter what that is. If it's flowered already or if it's in the process of flowering now, likely the flower buds were set back in the fall or late summer that's when the care was needed, you know, to, to produce those flowers. So I'm um, just throwing that out there. Um, somebody's got a six foot tall abelia, wanted to know if they could hack it down and uh, reset it. Yeah, absolutely. Most leafy evergreens. I could do that with this lower petalum right here. It's 12 foot tall lower petalum. I could cut it down to a foot and it'd come right back. Uh, most leafy evergreens, with some exceptions, um, can be, uh, can be cut down like that. And abelia bloom on new growth, so they'll still bloom this summer um, if you do it. Um, some people, uh, somebody asked me, do people approach me when I am out and about? Yeah, pretty much every time I go out someplace, um, I'll see somebody that, you know, um, I, I, I don't mind it at all. I typically turn this really quickly toward them. They'll want to talk about the channel or me or something. And I very quickly turn it around and ask them where they're from and what, you know, what they're doing and yada, yada. I just flip it the other direction as fast as possible. I have always been, a, you know, for me, if you do approach me, you can talk about anything other than gardening. How about that? Um, <laughs> how about the restaurant we're at? The, you know, anything. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. I, I had this thing where I would go to a party at somebody, you know, a new house, you know, go to a party. And I, before you walk in the door, go, do not tell these people what I do for a living. I don't want to be walking around their garden while everybody else is inside having fun. <laughs> I hate to say that, but you know, it becomes, you know, um, if somebody thinks you know something about this, um, they are very, um, uh, you know, you, you end up spending a lot of time talking about it, which is fine. I mean, this is, you know, uh, this is, this is m my life and I enjoy it. it greatly don't get me wrong in any way shape and form from that but there are times where i just would rather talk about basketball uh <laughs> or you know or, or soccer i'm a big chelsea soccer fan so if you you know if you support chelsea um you know we're, we're gonna have a new owner soon so if you want to talk about that let me know okay um and last question uh for this week and thank you guys um you know make, make sure that i i thank you when i when that que that was part of me writing that question down was um i do appreciate it um, everybody that walks up to me, I was in Costco the other day and it was three or four, three or four folks. If you're watching, hello. Um, you know, it was really, you know, it's really nice to know that, you know, when I'm sitting here in this chair, you know, answering these gardening questions or whatever, that it has some impact. Um, so I'm very great. I'm very grateful for that and very fortunate, um, honestly, um, that my, uh, that this has been my, uh, 36, 37 years of my life. Great. Okay. Um, and then the last question, 
Somebody asked if I had planted my agave yet, and yes, it was planted out at the street this week in a video if you haven't watched that video. And the coolest thing is I planted that agave out at the road and then yesterday went over to um, Jeremy's house to do an update video on the uh, wall project uh, at Jeremy uh, and Megan's house. Shot a tour video with him. You guys are going to see tomorrow, and it includes his one of his agave avatafolias is starting to um, um, send up its flower spike. So it's going to uh, it's it's going to die uh, this spring, but it's going to be awesome in the process. And so um, you guys will get to see that um, in the next couple of days. So thanks for watching. Thanks for participating. Thanks for asking questions, and um, I'll pick from some more for uh, next Sunday. Thanks for watching.